Oh wow, look at that recursion. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go through these examples. It's um, how to do dynamic HTML with JavaScript. I just want to kind of give you an introduction to this whole idea. So first we'll start with this basic HTML page that has a div on it that has an ID of posts. So this will be a blog, a blog page with many posts. So the div has the ID posts so that JavaScript can access that div later on. And here's a JavaScript file, uh, main.js, that's loaded here at the end of the body. It's loaded at the end of the body so that we can, be in, we can know that this div is already initialized before the JavaScript runs. Otherwise, you can, you can use like on load or something, but this is, I find it simpler to just do it this way. So you can get access to this DOM element on the page with document.getElementById. And I just want to reiterate, this is the HTML source code of the page. This provides the initial DOM document object model. But once it's loaded, that document object model can change around, and JavaScript code can change it around in many different ways. There's a whole big DOM API that you can look up the functions to. And this is one of the function calls, get element by ID. So we're looking up the ID posts, and this is the ID here. So it actually gives us a reference to this DOM element in memory. And then once we have a reference to the DOM element, we can set the inner HTML property on that element to be some HTML. And what that does is it changes the DOM element on the page. So here's the rendered page. Posts will go here. And if we inspect the element, it pops up, pops up this uh, DOM visualization thing where you can manipulate the DOM and look at it. So we can see that the original source code is here, but now there's this text inside that element posts will go here. So this is the fundamental idea of dynamic HTML. HTML that's set up by the HTML source code and then manipulated later on by JavaScript. So next, <coughs> the, uh, the only thing that's changed is this string is now HTML. I want to just point out that inner HTML can actually be HTML as a string. So this is just a string, you know, a sequence of characters in the JavaScript language. And when you set this HTML string to inner HTML, it gets parsed as HTML. Uh, so it's a div with an inline style that makes it red. And it says, hello, inner HTML. And that's what it looks like on the page. So inner HTML is one way of setting the content of things. Another way is to actually create the DOM elements with your JavaScript code. So this is the same. We're getting the element by the ID. And then document.createElement will create a brand new DOM element that's not in the DOM. It's kind of hanging freely. It's not attached anywhere, but it's been created. So we're creating a new div element. It's just, it has a reference by JavaScript. It's not on the page yet. We set the inner HTML of that to be, you know, post content. It'll be something different later. And then we say posts div, which is this div here that we looked up by the ID, dot append child post div, which is the new div that we created that's not on the DOM yet. So when we call append child, this takes the DOM that's hanging freely and it attaches it to the actual DOM as a child of this div. So now we, it says post content, and if we inspect this element, we can see that it's a div inside the posts div outside. So this is create element and append child, two kind of fundamental DOM APIs. And by the way, this is how you do it without using any libraries at all. This is all stuff that's built into the browser. You don't need jQuery for this. You don't need any libraries for this. The libraries just make the syntax nicer. But you need to understand this API first, I think, to really know what's going on. Because libraries like jQuery call these functions, but they just provide other functions for you that makes your code looks, 
you know, look smaller and nicer. So I've just changed the code a little bit to add this array. So we're creating a new array of strings. Post one, post two, post three. They're just strings as an array. Um, and then we're iterating over the posts with this for each construct. So you can iterate over things in an array in JavaScript in a few different ways. This is, I find, the nicest way. It's a functional version of for each. So any array has this method for each. And you pass into it a function. You pass a function into another function. It's functional programming. And that function takes as input one of the elements on the array. So this function gets called boom, boom, boom three, f three times, once for each post. So the first time it's called this variable post is post one. And the second time it'll be post two, and so on. And now we're creating a, a div, setting the inner HTML to be that post, and then appending that child. And this is the result, post one, post two, post three. And if we inspect the elements, we can see that there are uh, three different divs here. So this is how you can iterate over an array and create DOM elements for each element in the array. So posts are not just strings. They're more complicated. They have authors, and they're authored at a certain time, and they have the content that should be rendered differently than like the author name, for example. So now this code is changed so that the posts is an array of objects. And each object has these three properties, name, author, and content. So the name is the name of the post, author is the name of the author, and the content is some long string that could have many paragraphs. That's like the, the, the blog post. So the way that we can create a page from this is for each post, now this variable post is the object. So we can use post.name, post.author, and post.content, and it'll work. It'll be available to us. So now that DOM creation code is just duplicated for these various fields. So it's creating an outer div, and then it's creating these three inner divs, and then appending the inner divs to the outer div here, and then here, finally, it's appending the outer div to the original div that was on the page. And so <coughs> the name has its own div, and the inner HTML of that div gets name, and so on for author and content. So if we look at the elements now, it looks like this. Uh, this is the original div that was created by the HTML, and then inside this div, we have two divs, one for each post. And then inside of each post div, we have the name, the author, and then the content of that post. So this is how you can create this more elaborate HTML structure with JavaScript from this data. So next, <coughs> we can incorporate CSS into this. So, so far we've just created divs. But the only thing that's changed here is this. Um, <coughs> this chunk of code sets the attribute. So once you have a reference to a DOM element, there are a huge number of functions available to you. Append child is one of them, and set attribute is another one of them. So we can set the class attribute, which normally you would type into the HTML, but you can set it dynamically like this. So I'm just giving each div a class so that it can be referenced by CSS later. So for example, the name gets the class post-name. And by the way, when you're naming things, uh, if you're naming things in JavaScript, the convention is to use camel case. You know, it's like this, camel case, where the, each new word gets a capital letter. But in CSS, for classes and IDs and things, uh, camel case, whoops, camel case doesn't work that well 
Uh, well, I mean, it works, but it's not the convention. So people will see it and be like, well, why isn't he following the convention? The convention is to use dashes instead in CSS. And it's just a historical thing, but it's better to follow this convention so your code looks clean. So we're setting the class attributes on the DOM. So if we inspect the elements now, we can see that they have a class attribute. This, this is the post name, this is the post author, and this is the post content. So now that they have classes, these class attributes, CSS can be used to style them, just like HTML that you write by hand. So um, now a CSS file has been added, and in that CSS file, it just uses the dot selector, which selects the class. So for each post name, make it bigger. For each post author, make it blue. And for each post content, make it green. So we can see in the rendered page, you know, the, this is bigger, this is blue, and this is green. And it works. And there's two posts. But if you have more posts, it would just automatically work. So this is how you can create dynamic pages with JavaScript, JSON, and CSS that look nice. So the code is all kind of jumbled together. The next step that I would do is to refactor it into functions. So now in the JavaScript, there's a function called render posts that takes as an argument this posts data, which is an array. And all this code is the same. And then there's a new function get posts that gets the data for the posts. And it just returns this JSON structure. So this is getting ready for loading the posts from the server, from a file or from a database. The first step is to refactor into different functions. And next, I just rearranged the functions a little bit so that they're asynchronous, so that one of them is asynchronous, the g this get posts. It's not really asynchronous. So first of all, asynchronous means that it doesn't happen right away. It happens sometime later. It could be a fraction of a second later, or it could be several seconds later, or a minute later. And you can't do things serially if something's asynchronous. You need to deal with asynchronous control flow in JavaScript. And this is one of the sort of trickier things in JavaScript. And the simplest solution is to have a callback function. So let's say loading this file, for example. We're going to load the data from a file. We have some function, and it can take as, a call, as a, an argument a callback function that will be called later once the file is loaded with the content of the file. So that's the idea of asynchronous functions. So let's see the code here, what, what has changed. So before, get posts just returned this object. And in the new version, get posts takes as an argument a callback function. And it creates this posts variable in the scope of this function. And it just calls the callback with posts. So this is actually synchronous. It gets invoked right away. But it's like in preparation for it being asynchronous. So we're creating this posts object, passing it to the callback. And so then when we use this get posts function, we need to pass it a function. And the function can be in line like this. Define a function that takes posts as an argument. And then once that function gets called, it calls render posts and pass, passes in posts. And render posts is the same thing from before that just constructs that DOM structure. So this is a little bit of refactoring in preparation for loading the file from somewhere else. So right now, the, the content of the blog is in our JavaScript file, but it should be somewhere else. So next, we're going to fetch the JSON file using XML HTTP request. So XML HTTP request is, it, it revolutionized the web when it when it came out. So before XML HTTP request, all the HTML needed to be generated on the server, pretty much. I mean, this was like, I don't know, many years ago. 
And uh, once HTML, once this thing came out, XML HTTP request, it enabled what's called AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Originally, they thought people would just use XML all the time, but that's shifted. Now people are using JSON. It's just simpler than XML. So what this thing does, XML HTTP request, you can uh, create one of these XML HTTP request objects and then call some functions on it and it will, inside the page, it will make an HTTP request to a server and get the results back and then you can access the results from your JavaScript code. So this is the essence of AJAX. So what AJAX means, there's one page that's loaded and that page makes additional requests to, to the server. And usually it's for little bits of data, you know, XML or JSON. It's not requesting H HTML usually, it's just little bits of data because the sites are data driven. So, and all these AJAX libraries are built on XML HTTP request. So if you use jQuery, it's actually calling this. Or if you use Angular, it's calling this. So this is what it looks like. So before, the get posts function was just this dummy function in preparation for it being asynchronous um, that just calls the callback right away with the posts object that was just created right here in the code. And in the next version, the get posts function uses XML HTTP request to make a request to the server for this JSON file. And now the posts is in a JSON file. So JSON means JavaScript object notation. If you make an, a JavaScript object on the page and in your code, and you just write that object structure to a file and name it .json, you can load it in as a JSON file and parse it in, into an object in memory. But be careful because the property names need to be quoted. Like this right here is valid in JavaScript code, but it's not valid uh, JSON. In order to be valid JSON, you need to, whoops, it needs to be quoted like this. So I'm going to run through this function. It creates an XML HTTP request. It sets request.onload to be a function, and onload is part of the API for XML HTTP request. And this function will be invoked once the data is loaded. And when it's loaded, it will be, the data will be available as request.response text. It'll just be a big string of JSON text. So once we get that JSON text, we can call json.parse. And this is another API that's built into the browser. You can parse and serialize JSON in the browser. So that now this is the posts object. It's really the same object as it was before, but now it's loaded from the server. And then we're calling the callback with posts. And request.open, the first argument is get, means it's an, H an HTTP get request, as opposed to put or delete or something else. And it's getting posts.json. And this is a URL, but it works because it's relative to the page. It's right next to the page on disk. And then the third argument is whether it's asynchronous or synchronous. So if you make it synchronous, well, first of all, don't make it synchronous. If you make it synchronous, it means that everything on the page, everything on the page will stop executing until that file is loaded. It means you can't click any buttons, you know, you can't even scroll, I think. So it really halts the execution of the page until that thing is loaded. So in general, if you're loading data on a page, it's better to make it asynchronous because while the thing is loading, you know, the page is still running and the JavaScript is still running. So this makes the request. Once it's loaded, it calls this function, which parses the JSON, passes it to the callback. And in this case, this is the callback. And it just calls render posts with posts. And the result is the same page that we had before. So this is how you can use XML HTTP request to fetch a JSON file and then render it to the page. And the next example just cleans up the code. Like I added the header comments. 
and I'm wrapping the code in a self-invoking function so that it's not introducing any variables to the global namespace. And this is something you can read about. It's generally good practice, but it's not really necessary if it's just like your page, you know, but it's just good to be aware of. So the whole thing is a function that's getting called right away. And it's not introducing any global variables. Before, all the functions were global variables, which is not really good practice. <coughs> And another thing I changed is I used the single var pattern. So instead of different var statements, there's just one var statement at the top of the function. That's, in general, good practice because in JavaScript, variables are closure scoped. They're, cl they're scoped to the function, to the curly braces of the function, not the block. So if you have a for loop with a block, like in Java, you can have new variables in that block, and everything will be fine. But in JavaScript, if you have a block, like in a for loop, and you make a variable in there, it actually, the scope of that variable is relative to the function. So it's misleading to declare variables inside of a for loop, you know, because that's not actually what it's doing. It's, it's a phenomenon called hoisting. If you, if you declare a, a variable anywhere in the function, it, it actually gets hoisted to the top of the function. Like, so everything can access that as though it were declared at the top of the function. So it's better to just actually declare it at the top of the function so the code actually tells you what it's doing in the correct way. So that's an overview of you know, how to make a simple Ajax page with JSON and just the DOM APIs and no libraries. And I want to introduce one more thing media queries. So let's take a look at this uh, page. So if we, if we run the page full screen and we resize it, at a certain point, things change. See, the font gets bigger a little bit and the margins go away. And this makes sense to do if <coughs> you want to target mobile devices. So let's say we're an iPhone. It would look like this. You know, but if you're on a browser, it looks like this. So how does this work? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question was, is it um, DPI or is it, is it the resolution of the device or is it the aspect ratio? Aspect ratio? Huh. Well, it actually goes by the width. The width of the device, of the, of the resolution. So it's based on the resolution and the width only. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Uh, that's, I believe that because in the CSS, it says max width. And actually, probably you could do it with other things. I think maybe you can do it based on various things. Like maybe you could do it based on the aspect ratio if you wanted to. But I think this is the most common using the max width. So this here is a CSS media query. It's a new, you know, relatively new thing in HTML5. It's at media. Max width is 980 pixels. 980 pixels is, uh, I think it's like the width of an iPad or something. I don't know. It's like a standard thing used to, to differentiate between browsers and mobile devices. So it means this CSS will only be applied on small screens. And it's just regular CSS, you know? But uh, so in this case, it, it reduces the margin and it makes the content of the post bigger. There's a CSS rendering algorithm that's really complicated. And one of the parts is, you know, for each media query, if the display resolution is less than the specified resolution, then only in that case apply this CSS. Okay. And if that case is no longer true, then remove, you know, don't apply this CSS. So it's conditionally applied CSS based on the size of the screen. So right now, it's more than 980, and we can actually see where 980 is by slowly resizing it until boom you know so right here on this border that's the 980 I think if you put the inspector tools on it actually tells you the resolution at the top right oh cool let's see if i can oops inspector tools show you the resolution if you resize it online it does it at the top right it will oh cool so you can actually see the depth of value which makes it a lot yeah easier. Yeah, guessing sucks. That's a nice feature. Yeah, cool. 
And I want to just mention quickly that Bootstrap is based on this. Bootstrap is a nice CSS framework that a lot of people are using, and I would recommend checking it out at least. Um, you just include Bootstrap on your page, and then you can use these classes. You don't need to write any CSS to use Bootstrap. You just use the classes and base off these examples. So um, it's, a, it's a responsive design, and it has a grid system that's responsive. So this, you can use Bootstrap, for example, to make like a two-column page. And then when it's on a mobile device, it becomes one column. That's it for my lecture. Th that's how you make a responsive uh, blog-like page driven by a JSON object uh, using CSS and using JavaScript to dynamically create DOM elements. Yeah, so the question is, on this repository that I asked you to fork, I have this server.js file, and Node is not running on GitHub pages, no. But I just have this because um, I find it's a convenient way to uh, serve the files locally. Because all you need is this little file <coughs> and Node installed. I mean, there's a million, billion ways to do it. To host an HTTP, you know, to serve your static files locally for development. So when you like save the file, you can refresh your browser and it's running over HTTP. And I think this is nice because it gives you a starting point to write server-side code also if you want to. So this is, by the way, a simple Node.js application. Node.js is a runtime environment for JavaScript that runs in Unix. And there's a bunch of APIs for Unix. So you can write Unix-like uh, server-side applications or command line applications with JavaScript using Node.js. And one of the packages is Express. And it's got this module system, so you can call require Express. Express.js is a nice web application framework for Node. <coughs> you can define routes. So you can define, like, if you access slash something slash something else, it calls some function in JavaScript, which may read a file or read from a database or write to a database, and then render your page or, or give you your JSON. So this is just serving static files, this line right here. And then it's turning on the server on port 8000. And then it's just logging a message saying that it's running. But this is really tangential. It's like it's just a little development tool uh, that I like to use on my machine to host the page to like test it out. The example code that I just ran through is in this repository. It's, it's exactly the same. I want you to fork it. So forking is different than cloning. Forking means you, you have a copy of the repository inside of your GitHub account. So I want you to first fork it and then clone it to get it onto your physical machine. Your exercise for the rest of the class, for the next hour, make it really look like a blog. 